Hi everyone, I'm Zana Freilon and I'm the author of The Lost Soul Atlas. The Lost Soul Atlas is a story about a young boy called Twig. At the very beginning of the story, Twig wakes up to find himself in the afterlife, but he has only really vague memories of how he got there. And he has to decide if he would like to stay in this blissful existence in which he remembers nothing of his life on earth or to journey through the afterlife to try and regain his memories and to find his missing dad. But if he fails, it will be as though Twig never existed at all. And as Twig journeys, we begin to find out just what happened in his life that led to his death. And Twig has to confront his life and all the choices he made if he is ever going to make it through. But can he ever be truly happy when his best friend remains alive and in danger? The Lost Soul Atlas is about kids who have fallen through the cracks. Kids who don't have any adults to look out for them or to look after them. But they do have each other. And sometimes when you get rid of the adults, that's when the best adventures can be had. This book has all my favourite things in it. It has maps, it, had, it has riddles, it has a skeleton raven. So come on, settle down, make yourselves comfortable, and I'll read the first little bit for you right now. Are you ready? Here we go. The Lost Soul Atlas. Prologue. The Beginning. In the beginning, the gods were bored. There was nothing to do anymore. They had made their world and their creatures. They had played and built things and flooded things and dried things. And now they were bored. The souls of the people weren't bored. They had memories to hold on to and stories to tell. They had loved ones to watch over and places to haunt. They quite enjoyed being dead. But gods can be jealous beasts. For why should people have all the fun? And so the gods decreed that when souls arrived in the afterlife, they would enter a state of blissful unknowing. They would forget their time on earth. Memories were banished to the edges of the afterlife. And so it was. It was the god of winter mornings who suggested they should all try a memory or two just to see what the fuss was about. The memories entered their beings, fed them smells and sights and sounds and feelings. For a small time, the gods existed purely within those small snatches of life. But once tried, the gods wanted more. They wanted bigger, stronger memories. Memories to make them feel alive. The gods took matters into their own hands. With just a flick of their heavenly fingers, they could create all the memories they needed. Destruction was rained down upon the earth. Wars were waged. Walls were built. The earth was mined and torn and sundered. Seas rose and fires ravaged. Everything got a little hotter. Memories got a lot stronger. Souls arrived more quickly. Their memories hoarded more readily. The gods feasted. And so it was. Chapter One. The End. And so it was. This was it. The end. Twig couldn't look at those eyes or the arm aiming. It didn't tremble, that arm. Not even a bit. Neither did Twig. Go on. Do it then. I dare you. And the whole world exploded. Wherever he was, it was dark. Deep dark. The thick, heavy dark that claws at your throat and scratches at your eyes. The kind of dark that picks you up and tosses you around and holds you close and whispers promises and pulls you apart. And just as Twig no longer knew if he even still existed, a neon sign burst into life and stilled him in its light. Welcome to the afterlife. Oh. That was the only word he could think of for quite some time. The sign was broken. It made that fizzing, static sound that a loose connection makes, and the bulbs behind some of the letters flickered, spat, and gave up. Without the bulbs, the sign now read, We come to life. 
Twig shuddered and gave the sign a cautious poke. A whole string of lights blossomed around him, glittering and twinkling along the edges of an old cobblestoned path that stretched and twisted into the darkness. They made Twig think of that time they had all wrapped fairy lights along the graves between the shacks and bought fish and chips and... And the crows drive it, dive in for the chips and... Here's to us! We're the beasts of the city wilds! And we all race to the top of the gargoyle tomb so we can look out over everything that's ours. The memory was like a snatch of a dream, refusing to stand still. The more Twig tried to grab hold, the more his thoughts dimmed and fuzzed at the edges. He rubbed at his arms and wished he was in more than just his shorts and a t-shirt. It wasn't the warmth he wanted, but the security of being wrapped tight. He peered into the dark, stretching from the path. It was a forest, Twig decided. A very thick, very dark, very foresty forest. Every so often, a branch would shuffle in the breeze and a leaf would catch in the twinkle of the lights. Twig imagined he could hear the rustle of branches being pushed aside. The snuffle of something lurking. His head throbbed. What was it that had happened exactly? He reached around to rub the pain from the back of his head and his hand came away bloodied. There had been something. It was silver and pointing and he'd known how dangerous it was to be pointed at like that with... What was it? Twig could remember the laugh, cold and iced and hollow, that had sent shivers down his spine. The eyes he couldn't look at. The clap, clap. Another light fizzed into life, its bright red arrow pointing forward. Okay, this way it is, Twig said out loud and was surprised by the dullness of his voice, like he was being quietened. Everything seemed quietened. Even his footsteps along the path were just the whisper of a step. There were more signs now. Twig slowed to read each one and touch the letters. He liked the feel of something real and solid under his fingertips. Be welcomed at our welcome centre, two miles. Keep to the path. You are safe and happy. Golden gates ahead. Leave your troubles behind. Everything is fine. Stay on the path. Emotional baggage drop-off point, all bags to be left here. Forest trail closed, entry prohibited. Do not feed the banshees. It is all so lovely here, just perfect. Some signs were nailed onto wooden stumps, others lit in bright lights like the signs down the high street in casinos where Twig and the beasts would scout for dropped coins and open pockets. Watch it! And hands are reaching and someone is yelling and the coppers are pointing and... But the memory was like seeing something underwater, all vague and choppy and not quite there. It made him a bit panicky not being able to remember. But as soon as he thought that, another feeling washed over him, whispering through his mind. Everything is so lovely here. Keep walking. You have nothing to worry about. I have nothing to worry about, Twig said, and kept walking. The further he walked, the lighter the sky became, like he was walking his way to morning. He focused on walking towards the light, and with each step he felt his spirits lift, as if the light from the sky was seeping inside him. By the time he reached the welcome centre one and a half miles sign, it seemed that nothing really mattered anymore. Even the forest didn't seem so sinister. Twig paused to admire the brilliant swirling green of a leaf fallen on the path and watched as a line of tiny stick figure people weaved their way across the cobbled stones and into the forest. They were like little drawings come to life. They hummed a happy sort of tune as they walked and each one carried an assortment of bits and pieces on its head or back. Buttons, a ring, an ancient looking bell, one had tied a string to an old rusted meeting spot sign and was heaving it along the ground, inching its way slowly forward. The smallest of the figures turned to Twig and waved a little stick figure wave, the kind of wave one gives an old friend. That was when the thing saw Twig, flying overhead, a darkened patch against the light blue of the sky. It had been looking for the boy, searching and now it had him in its sights, it would not lose him again. It circled, closer and closer. And just as Twig started to walk again along the path, the thing clicked its beak and swooped. Well, I hope you enjoyed that first little taste of the Lost Soul Atlas. 
Do you know, I didn't even mean to write this book. I'd already started the book I was meant to be writing. And then an image shuffled ever so slyly into my head. An image that didn't fit at all with the book I was supposed to be writing. It was Im an image of a scruffed, dirty kid stepping from the shadows, their hands outstretched and whispering to me, come with me, I can show you how to fly. I couldn't resist. And that was it. I started to trail this character and their story and soon I found myself so deep in the realms of myth and folklore that I began to see signs and omens everywhere. I was hearing whispers where there should be none. I was seeing shadows when there was no light to cast them. I bought myself a magic eight ball and I have to admit that the advice it has given so far has been pretty excellent. And sometimes that's the best way to write a story. To allow yourself to be led, to throw all your plans out of the window and just see where you end up. Okay, so I've got an activity for you. You might want to do it. First of all, before we get on to the activity, we need a bit of a warm up. So what I need you to do first of all is to write down a list of five or ten places that you know and have been to. These might be places like my school or the local fire station or they might be places that have a memory attached to them like the park where I lost my soccer ball. Don't spend a long time on this, just jot them down really quickly. Okay, go. Okay, now you've done that and I've had my cup of tea while I waited for you, we can get on to the real activity. As you may have guessed by the fact that I wrote a book called The Lost Soul Atlas, I love maps. I love how exciting they are. I love the promise of adventure and stories waiting to be discovered. I love how they can make something fictional feel real and of this world. But more than the actual maps themselves, I love the edges of maps. The bits that have fallen off the edge, that we can't see or that haven't yet been explored. The bits that promise, here be dragons. Because that is where the real adventures begin. For me, the afterlife, or the underworld, is the ultimate edge of the map. There aren't many people, even in myths and fairy tale and folklore, who have ventured into the underworld and who have the ability to come back and map it. So today what we are going to do is, you are going to create your own afterlife. For me, writing The Lost Soul Atlas, the creation of the afterlife was the most fun part of all. It could be absolutely anything. And I took my inspiration from everywhere. From books, from folklore, from pictures, from drawings, poems, songs, art galleries, museums. And most of all, I took my inspiration from street art and graffiti. I stole ideas from all over the place and jotted them down in my notebook. So you might find you want to do something similar. This might be an activity that extends beyond today that you keep coming back to and adding to. The afterlife I started with looked nothing like the afterlife as it ended up in the book. So editing and adding and changing is all part of the process and it's one of the most fun parts of the process. Okay, so first of all, your afterlife needs a landscape. What does it look like? Where is it? Is it in the clouds? Is it under the ground? Is it a city or a jungle or a space station? Does it exist on the back of a flea? The first draft of the Lost Soul Atlas, my afterlife existed entirely inside a giant train station. So once you've worked out what kind of place your afterlife is, then brainstorm a whole list of landmarks that might exist in your afterlife. Are there portals to other realms? Are there landmarks like tourist sites or zoos? Are there streets or libraries? Is there a valley of floating teacups or a hill of giant jam sandwiches? Is there somewhere everyone wants to get to or something everyone wants to find? What things might exist that stop people getting there? What things might happen that stop people getting what they want and of succeeding? Make a list of everything that pops into your head, no matter how silly or strange it might seem. So when you've done that, the next thing your afterlife needs are monsters. The afterlife is full of them. Make another list of all the monsters and creatures and beasts that exist in your afterlife. 
They might be monsters from myths or folk tales or fairy tales, or they might be monsters that no one knows about. You could spend a very long time imagining and creating your own monsters. Try and make sure that you describe your monsters as best you can. How big are they? Are they dangerous? Do they have a weakness? What do they want? Perhaps you could even create your own afterlife field guide to help lost souls who might encounter some of the beasts you've created. You might even want to list other native flora and fauna that exist in your afterlife. So once you have your landscape and your monsters, grab a great big piece of paper and start to map out your afterlife. Start with the landscape, mapping out where all the landmarks go. You can use labels or a key. It can be sketched or painted. It could even be done in collage. It can be detailed or it could be mostly unexplored. But get all your ideas down on the paper. Then add in your monsters. Perhaps they have lairs dotted around the place. Or is there a known vampire feeding zone? Or perhaps you just mark the spot with a note that says, here be dragons. Now finally, just to really mix things up a little, we are going to put you on the map. Do you remember that list of places I told you to write? Well, if you're brave enough, if you dare, plot those places on your afterlife map. So maybe one of them was grandma's house. Get granny and stick her somewhere on your map. Or maybe one of them was the place I dropped my ice cream. Find a place on the map and add a note, something like, ice cream was dropped here, or valley of falling tears and melted dreams. Now imagine yourself in this world you have created. Would you make it all the way through, all the way through all the trials and tribulations? And if you had one piece of advice to give yourself, what would it be? There is so much more that you might want to do with this. You might want to create spirit guides and guardians. Who would be your guardian or guide? How would you choose? Or would they choose you? You might want to decide on a special talisman from your home or your room or your school that you could take with you to help you on your journey. You might think of riddles that need to be answered or tasks that need to be completed. You might write a poem or find a lyric to put on your map. You might add more memories or real world places to your afterlife map to make it feel even more real. You might decide to make a whole tourist guide for your afterlife or invent an afterlife language. And when you are out in the real world, you might just begin to notice things that belong in your afterlife. Perhaps there are portals between the two worlds, worlds, doors or boundary spaces, which makes me wonder what would happen if one of your afterlife creatures was to find their way through the door and into our world. I hope you have as much fun exploring and adventuring and journeying with your maps and your stories as I did writing The Lost Soul Atlas. Thank you for joining me. Bye.